Hello and welcome to another episode of Inside the Borough, the FEU podcast for and by Owls fans, presented by FEUOwlsNest.com. Oh man, last Saturday, that was a drag. Uh, with us this week, we have a former FEU Owls Nest contributor, uh, Cyrus Smith. Uh, you, you guys remember him when we had him on after the Air Force game. We're having him on again to talk about this this disappointment against UAB. I mean, it's, you know, the Blazers defending conference USA champions. We knew it would be a tough test, but, but Cy, buddy, I mean, what, what, what's your takeaway from this? I mean, did, did you, was, was this as bad as, as a performance as, as you were expecting? Cause I don't think anyone is really expecting this. Hello, Jake. Um, Jack. Um, uh, it's uh, it was tough. I was certainly not expecting a loss. Um, definitely expecting a win and a lot more disappointed. And just kind of the team's performance. Uh, once again, we saw a slow start, very similar to the last time when I came on the podcast against Air Force, where the team just immediately came out and just looked very lethargic, didn't come with a lot of energy. And I had a feeling that UAB would come out a lot more amped in the second game of their brand new stadium, considering how. Their blowout loss to Liberty kind of left them with a bad taste in their mouth. So I knew that they would bring it. But I figured that FAU would kind of try to come out and make a statement. Like you mentioned, this was a pretty highly anticipated game. I mean, these are the the last two teams that have won Conference USA, the last four um, champ, Conference USA championships. So um, I knew that we would be in for a game, but I figured that FAU would definitely win, um, not by like an absurd amount, but win a tight one, if not by like something about 14, 10 points. And they look like they have the talent on the field to do so. But execution wise from the offense just kind of um, once again, kind of left us wanting more. I mean, yeah, it, I, it was pretty similar to the Air Force game because of how slow the offense started. I mean, the first two plays were turnovers. You cannot give a team like UAB. Yeah, they don't have the best offense in the world, but you cannot give a team uh, that have all, all that returning talent from last year's really stellar team, you know, b- besides Spencer Brown, obviously, at running back, you can't give them that many opportunities. It doesn't matter if you're playing UTEP, Southern Miss, whoever, uh, that's going to cost you. And, and that was probably the game right there. Or If not that, I mean, especially the pick six, I mean, Oh my God. Uh, one of the, the, I, it is the, the longest uh, play against FAU in program history. Uh, it's officially a 100 yard interception. College football does not do um, yards into the end zone and on the way out. Oh man, that hurt. I mean, cause you're looking like we're about to go into halftime. You know, we're, we, you know, we, we scored, uh, you know, momentum is, is starting to go our way and it's a, it's a 14 point swing is what it is. And I was really hoping, okay, halftime, let's let's talk it over. We've had our fair share of turnovers now. Obviously, it's not our cup of tea. Um, we know that Nikosi doesn't really put uh, the ball in bad situations, if you will. He doesn't really um, – he's not a gunslinger. I was just going to throw it up there and, and, and have an interception. Obviously, he was trying to force that one to try and uh, bring us back into it. Uh, but you think on second half, okay, fine. We get the ball again. Let's see if we can do something with it. And then once we weren't able to do much with that, that's what I thought was the nail on the coffin. Because uh, it was giving UAB just another opportunity. It almost became a 21-point swing at that point. So, Sly, which one do you think was a bigger detriment to FU's comeback? Uh, was it the two turnovers out the gate or was it that pick six? Because remember, that, that second turnover, I don't believe they scored off of that one. It was a uh, a block field goal uh, ended that. So both ended up in seven points. Just I think one was a 14 point swing instead of know, starting off the game 14 <laughs> zero. What do you think? Uh, I think I would for sure vote for the, the pick before the half, because you have to remember, even leading up to it, the offense was definitely getting into some sort of rhythm. The, the driver two before it definitely felt like they figured out UAB's defense and when they were getting them on their heels a bit and Perry just before that interception was make had made a couple of really nice throws and improvised on the run with a nice catch and run to I believe it was Western and so once you're in the red zone you're definitely thinking all right we're getting at least three points here defense is playing well to keep us in the game even despite those two turnovers and putting them in bad field position um Stoops has had done a really good job as far as once again getting the, that side of the ball prepared and uh, making a lot of stops 
to make to give Tagger and Co. you know enough time to kind of make their adjustments and kind of get their stuff together. And so the the pick was just so deflating because it kind of felt like, all right, here we go again. You know, like that dreadful, like, okay, like we d- we've already the, the the margin for error was already slow or thin just because of the two turnovers before. So we had already known that any another turnover in a bad spot would likely be the deciding factor in who would win the game. And to have it at that critical moment and then to not tackle the UAB player and like not prevent a pick six, like that was, that was the deal breaker. And then of course, in the second half, you know, once again, it seemed like Perry was getting the confidence. We started to involve Ford a bit more on the ground and it seemed like we were getting, generating some, some sort of momentum. And then of course we missed the field goal. And then after that, it just felt like, you know, the, the team just felt deflated um, and that a comeback was not going to be imminent. <laughs> Um, yeah. Which, you know, you know, you can't really, I thought that the defense performed admirably and well, considering the circumstances. I mean, they got a turnover. You would have liked them to maybe get two more in order to bring us up, up in the game. But, but once you're facing a good team like UAB, you know, that's the one thing that they're not going to do. They're not going to gift you the ball. And they're not going to give you a lot more opportunities and chances. You know, Bill Clark is one conference USA coach of the year many times for a reason and so the outcome was definitely a disappointment but how we reached there was not all at all a surprise once that interception um occurred right before the half it, you know one thing that we kind of pride ourselves um FULs pride ourselves uh, is, is having a sense of energy a sense of swagger you mean you mentioned that that the team looked flat when it came to energy uh, at Colorado Springs against Air Force now I think by the fourth quarter there was just no energy left. Uh, they looked defeated themselves, which is a shame because uh, the game was still winnable at the time, but there's there just nothing there, um, especially once Perry went out. Tronti did well, but, um, I mean, we were, we were not able to talk to Coach Taggart today because of the bye week about uh, Perry's hand, but apparently the day before, his, his stitches uh, uh, opened up, hence why he wore a, a glove on his throwing hand. Uh, we had no idea that the injury was that bad stemming back uh, two weeks ago and the win in the Shula Bowl. Uh, but, I mean, who knows? I mean, if Perry stays in for the fourth quarter, maybe the score is not as lopsided as it was. Um, but at the same time, the lack of a rushing attack, I mean, it definitely helps out the defense there because they know that, the, you know, an air raid is coming either way. Uh, which, which brings up, you know, my next question, so many great running backs, what's, what's going on? Uh, f- for me, I, I think, I think it's time to have a discussion about the offensive line at this point, because it seems like Perry, you, you, midway point of the season, you would like to have the offensive line, have the chemistry and gel be all together. But Perry, it seems like he's always on the run. Uh, or at least way too often we would like. He's great on his feet, as we saw a couple times, but too much for our comfort. And then the, the running backs, I mean, there's just no holes there. And don't get me wrong. I mean, Motor and Alfred Morris, they had a fight for their holes to make things happen. But it, it's not like Larry McCammon and Malcolm Davidson and even Posey, when we see him carry the ball, it's not like they're slouches by any means. So I don't. I, I think I think that's going to have to be something that's going to have to be looked at because it's um, right now it's not a winning formula. Yeah, I would say really that as we go into the bye week, you know, we have six data points with the offense now. We've seen where they most look explosive. You know, we have speed. So I'm wondering why we haven't really tested the perimeter as much um, as we've seen so far. A lot of the, the struggles with the offensive line mainly stems from – the interior play, we're not getting a lot of consistency there. And so the runs up the middle are not necessarily working, but we know with Ford speed, he can get, once he gets on the perimeter, I would like his odds against any defender in conference USA, as far as him beating that man one-on-one. Um, we didn't really see any screens either. Not a lot of misdir- misdirection, at least not um, outside of the red zone. And so um Those are the type of things that you kind of like to see when you have a struggling offensive line to get the defensive line back on their heels and kind of make sure that um, they can't stay ultra aggressive. And that kind of really stems from Tagger. And I think really, at least for me, what I'm learning 
based off of this regime compared to the one with Kiffin. You know, when Kiffin got here, he was already a pretty much a bona fide offensive play caller. You know, he's an offensive coordinator, offense specialist, guru, all that stuff. And with Tagger, we really only have maybe a couple of data points from his time at UCF and then his one year at Oregon where he's had prolific offenses, but it has hasn't come under the direction as far as under his coaching resume as a coordinator itself, but more or less as a head coach. And so um, without that coordinator experience, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to have to start readjusting my expectations for the offense because he's not um, an offensive guru, you know, even, even expecting him to put up Lane Kiffin's sort of numbers as far as like 50 points per game. I'm, I'm not expecting that, but just more consistency out of the unit and, through these six games, it's just been a lot of Jekyll and Hyde as far as not just game to game, but quarter to quarter, you know, um, Perry looks great um, for a couple of drives. And then we kind of see the the unit kind of stagnate. And outside of the Shula Bowl, um, there hasn't really been a lot of explosive plays against, you know, I guess, so to speak, against, you know, even competition. And so um, it, it's disappointing for sure. And you know, I think the bye week comes at a perfect time because it's not, even though it's a, it's a rough loss, it's not as if FAU's goals are not, you know, are not attainable. The season is still very much on the line as far as um, FAU winning CUSA East. And then of course, hopefully, hopefully um, winning the conference championship game. And all of that kind of stems from what we'll see out of the offense because six games in, I think Stoops has done a really great job of picking up where Levitt has left off and making sure that the defense is up to snuff and keeping FAU in these games. I can't imagine if this was a unit that was ranked near the bottom of Conference USA where FAU would, would be at as far as our projections going into the second half of the season. Yeah, Sarah, so I'm really happy that um, you're giving Coach Stoops his due credit because the defense is there. You know, we're seeing it. Yeah, sometimes it makes some plays that we're not too happy with, but they're at least putting us in a position to win. Um, and that, that's all you can ask for. They'll, they'll get a turnover here and there. They'll get a big stop. They do what they need to do. Um, r- real quick, you did mention the misdirection and added within the red zone. I, I know you love that section, that second touchdown, especially uh, that little misdirection, weird pass uh, to Wester. I mean, if you ask me, I don't even think he made it to the end zone, but I don't care. Uh, I digress. It went our way. Mute point either way. Um, but w- I mean, when it, when it comes to, you mentioned this a little bit about the future of the season, how, you know, there's still a lot to play for, especially a, a division title. Um, you know, we're, we're sitting in second place right now in the East division. Charlotte is first and guess who we have out of the bye week Charlotte. Yeah. It's a road game. We still haven't done <laughs> anything on the road. And uh, I asked coach tiger that in the post game and, and he says he, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand why. Uh, but it's an opportunity to to make things right. And we're currently tied with Marshall, and, and you have to think with how they struggled. Uh, <laughs> they were manhandled in Murfreesboro against Middle Tennessee, uh, and then they struggled against Old Dominion, who might be the worst team in FBS football, um, even though the UConn-UMass game, uh, which was a doozy, might have said something about that. Congratulations, Minutemen, on the win over uh, UConn. Uh, it is definitely still attainable. Our, our goals are still here. It, it might be doom and gloom, but like, dude, we just lost to the defending champions who a lot of people picked them to repeat this year uh, on the road in a hostile environment. The season is not over yet, people. Don't get me wrong. Saturday night, I was bummed as everyone else. Um, now, next Thursday, uh, not this one upcoming, but the following, if that's a loss, then okay, different story. I mean, I mean, it sucks that we have to play UAB and then Charlotte. I wish we could get Rice and, I don't know, Old Dominion, but, you know, here we are. They gave us FIU as a little cookie in, in, in the middle there. Even though it's, it's a rivalry game, you never know what happens. Um, so do, do you think that, honestly, do you think winning the East is is still possible at this point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Charlotte, um, I love what Coach Rohili is doing there, a young offensive um, innovator as far as um, – and dynamic recruiter at, at for Charlotte and the 49ers. Um, you know, their strengths and weaknesses play right into our strengths and weaknesses. So there's no reason why that shouldn't be a close game other than the fact that our performance on the road hasn't been um, 
great this year. I mean, they're not, they don't have a good run defense. FIU kind of was really, really productive against them. Um, and we have a great rushing offense, or at least we have a great running backs on paper. So they should be able to figure out something during this bye week and kind of use those, exploit those weaknesses from Charlotte, but they also have a really dynamic offense, but as, as far as I'm concerned, FAU's defense should be able to match them or at least to a draw for next week. Um, if you want to project forward and look at Western Kentucky, they're really a, a one-half team. They have a really great offense, a really, really bad defense. They just lost a really a great game against UTSA, but they gave up 52 points. Now, they will score, but they will let other teams score. So there's no reason why FAU shouldn't be able to give WKU a game, if not win it outright. And then, of course – projecting down the line with Marshall. They just don't look really that good. It's a transition year for them. Um, I know a lot of people were projecting them to win Conference USA. I was not one of those people. I, I saw definitely what we're seeing now, um, though not that's that much of a struggle against Old Dominion. And then, of course, you have the bottom of the conference with FIU and then Old Dominion, who um, gave Marshall a game, but I think there's just a talent de deficiency there compared to the rest of CUSA. So expectations for winning the East? Yes, I still expect for FAU to win the East but they need to get it together on the road in this game next week. This is really for um, what set the tone for the rest of the year. If they can win this game and beat Charlotte, UTEP is looking stronger, but there's no reason why FAU shouldn't take care of business at home. And then I just kind of give the breakdown, breakdown again with the other CUSA East component, opponent. So I, I still like FAU to win the division, but I must admit I am wearing my come to the FAU <laughs> uh, Lane Kiffin shirt from back in the day. So um, you kind of know where I stand with the Owls, but looking forward, um, it wouldn't surprise me if FAU finished first or at the least second. They just really do have to figure out um, their identity, um, specifically on the road. I'm, I'm happy you said that. Yeah, on the road. Uh, and that, that Charlotte game, I, I think, will decide that. So uh, there's still still a chance to make it right. Uh, that Western Kentucky UTSA game. Holy smokes, man. What a game that was. You know, it's, it's hilarious. You had two possible... Uh, Conference USA championship matchups, Western Kentucky, uh, who, who look great, by the way, and UTSA, who are the only undefeated team in the entire nation, not ranked, trash. But I, I'll move on. Uh, and then UAB and FAU, you know, the, the last uh, four Conference USA champions uh, in that one game in Birmingham. Both of them, both of those games were on stadium. They were online. You know, there's no like like watch ESPN, no CBS Sports, nothing. It tells you what you need to say about the state of conference USA right now. Um, WKU looks good, but you're right, that defense, holy smokes, man. I mean, I don't want to disrespect UTSA's offense. Uh, Sincere McCormick is a, a great running back. Uh, Frank Harris has really come to his own at a, at a quarterback position, but that's <laughs> – I was not expecting that many points uh, from the Roadrunners. Um, and yeah, Marshall just looks laughable. At least I'm laughing, you know? Uh, so, so we'll see, uh, DJ Mack Jr. And, uh, the Monarchs, uh, I mean, Hey, they took Marshall in a really tough place to play up there in Huntington, took them to overtime. And then you have to watch out for uh stock still and co, uh, against, you know, middle Tennessee. Uh, they had an impressive win against Marshall. Yeah. Marshall might not be as good as some of the pundits were thinking. Uh, but they blew them out like a good team should. Situate the, the issue is that Middle Tennessee hasn't done squat since then. So we'll see how the East turns out. Uh, it, it, it's funny. F FAU football tweeted a picture of, of the uh, Shula Bowl trophy being updated with, with this year's score and everything. And I almost thought to myself, that's great, cool. But what about the Conference USA trophy? I, I, I feel like with the Lane Kiffin years, as, as you say, and as your shirt says, I mean, the Lane Kiffin, there's a silhouette of him on, on the, in the back of that shirt, if I remember correctly. Um, that was the expectation is to win conference championships. And Coach Tiger said that from the get-go. And, and, hey, man, I mean, we were one game away from being in the conference USA championship last season. Um, but I definitely feel like that expectation, that culture, that Lane built and that Willie Taggart wants to build upon, I think it's here because we're now saying, well, what's next? This isn't good enough. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think that we should be calling student athletes out by names. Never, never, never in a million years. 
I don't think we should be asking for coaches to be fired uh, midseason. That's a little extreme. We're not Florida State guys, you know. I'm not saying anyone is doing that either. Um, but I am pretty happy that we're hungry. The fan base is hungry. And I can guarantee you that the student athletes want to accomplish their goals too. Um, that being said, I, I think anything less than second place in the East would be a massive disappointment, would be a failure. Uh, so hopefully we still have a lot to play for come November as well. Um, and, and the East division is wide open again. I know I've said this 20 times already, but it's, it's, oh, there goes my flag. It's <laughs> that, that, that's Marshall right there in a nutshell, just falling apart. Anyways, if, if we beat Charlotte next week, then everyone in the division has at least one loss. The only teams, um, if, if that were to happen going into the weekend, you know, Friday and Saturday, um, with a loss would be Charlotte, FAU, Marshall, and Western Kentucky. We're going to be about the top four teams in the division anyways. They are who you thought they were. So uh, we still have it all to play for. I think we can do it. I think we're hungry. I think it's a good thing. Hopefully the offense can can fix their offensive woes, no doubt about it. Is, is there one thing that you want to see in particular? Because for me, it's it's the running game improve. Uh, I think if that doesn't happen, then then we can just say goodbye to first place, goodbye to second place, all of that. Uh, is there one thing that you really want to see improvement on in order for the Owls to reach their goals? I'm with you, Jack. I think it's the running game. I mean, FAU now has um, the tradition with, you know, churning out running backs that are successful and that can move on to the NFL. And we know the talent that's on the roster that where at least one or two of these guys will definitely get this shot in the NFL when their time comes, whether that be Ford or McCammon or Davidson. So that's the ex expectation that I have. There's too much talent um, in the backfield for there not to be um, for this offense, not to finish near the top, as he was saying, rushing yards per game, total rushing yards, um, all that jazz. Um, it's just kind of been lackluster. And it's really the difference between a lot, a win here, um, a win here and there leading up into this bye week. That's really been the biggest disappointment of the season is that we haven't been able to run the ball as effectively as um, we're accustomed to seeing from an FAU team um, in this era, um, at least post um, uh, Stellenberger, but even then with Alfred Morris and Partridge years and whatnot with Spoder, um, we've always had good running backs and we have good running backs again this year. So um, for the fact that the rushing offense is kind of um, meh is kind of a, a disappointment. And I think that'll be the difference between whether FAU will win CUSA East or not. Whether they can win the Conference USA Championship game is a whole nother um, ball game considering what UCSA looks like. And then, of course, um, UAB and what they've just um, experienced or what we've just experienced at their hands this past weekend. Yeah, real quick. Uh, the West looks pretty good. Uh, a lot of undefeated teams over there. UTSA, UAB, uh, they have two wins. And so does 5-1 and one UTEP, 2-0 and oh in conference they're one game away from bowl eligibility uh, that's an awesome story uh law tech and rice are also undefeated um at home uh then you have north texas and southern miss who are both zero and two i i said undefeated at home i meant undefeated in conference play uh so the west is definitely up there but i i agree with you utsa uh looks strong and just our luck i mean we were hoping to pull a weak team from the West and we, we get the biggest surprise. Uh, one of the biggest surprises in the entire country. Granted, their schedule has been marshmallow fluff. Um, but I mean, so is ours to a point. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to suspect Air Force and so on and so forth. But I mean, Air Force looked, we made them look like Alabama with that score line. So um, we'll, we'll definitely see what happens. Definitely wish we had an easier route, but um as Thomas Paine said, uh, the more, what, what was it? The harder the triumph, uh, no, I'm going to get it. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. There it is. Thank you. This is why I, I, I gave up on becoming an education major. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, Sai, anything uh, you want to add before we sign off, my man? Nothing else, man. I'm, I'm just a little bit bummed out about FAU, but um, I still remain optimistic about the outlook of the season. And um, as far as obviously worst case scenario would be like something like five and seven, you know, not making a bowl or six and six. But I do have confidence that this is what's at least a seven one team. And like I said before, the expectations are definitely where um, anything worse than a um, second place finish in CUSA East would be a match.
massive disappointment. Great. I'm happy we see eye to eye there. Uh, yeah, you know, we were sitting one and one in conference play, three and three overall. 2017 and 2019, the team started off slow and they really turned it on the second half. Hopefully we can see something like that again this year. Uh, we have it all to play for still. It's still within our hands. If we want it, we can go out there and get it. So uh, hopefully next week, um, no game to talk about might be a good thing. Let the boys kind of think about it all, uh, strategize into what's now. I, I this is the third, fourth straight week I've said this. The biggest game of the season. Because if, if we lose this, then those goals that we mentioned earlier are uh, thrown into the trash. Whew, a lot of talk about next week with 10-year student athlete Chris Reynolds. <laughs> Fab probably getting his doctorates at this point. Uh, Miami native uh, Victor Tucker. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, but we're all gonna we're gonna be talking about the 49ers um, and Will Healy's uh, club lit uh, more than enough next week. So uh, hey, Sai, thank you so much for coming on, man. I, I really appreciate it. Hopefully you're staying warm over there in Colorado. I know it's gonna be a, a tough winter for you, um, but. From me up here in uh, North Carolina, guys, uh, it's been a real pleasure. A as always, you guys already know that this episode will go live on YouTube and FAU's Owl's Nest uh, on Tuesday. Uh, and then it will hit Spotify, Google, uh, Apple Podcasts on uh, Wednesday uh, morning, early afternoon around there. So uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, we'll get through this, everyone. We'll get through it, I promise. All right. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll talk to you sometime soon and go Owls.